Hello everyone, and this is the first lecture for our course uh, British Literature 2. And what I want to do in our first lecture is just give you some sense of generally how these lectures will work throughout the term. Um, my, you know, practice will be to upload a video um, for you at the beginning of every week. You'll probably see it on Sunday is when it will show up for you online. Um, and in that video, I will take some time, uh, generally about a half an hour, to talk about the canonical reading uh, or readings for the week, uh, to go into some detail about them. And I will also spend some time generally talking about some of the apocryphal possibilities in terms of those readings that you might also choose along the way. And the idea here is to give you some context for what you'll be reading and writing about over the course of the week. And indeed, you may find that you might read ahead, and that's perfectly perfectly fine. But I'll be taking time in these lectures to talk about some fundamental ideas that relate to the readings for that week. And also, as we go on, I'll be presenting some ideas that will connect the readings to previous weeks and potentially, for some of you, to other courses that you've already taken and completed um, at this university. Okay, so that's going to be the general practice. Now, how that bears out in terms of your work is that in a number of assignments you'll be getting from me, you will see that I will ask you to uh, quote me uh, or reference uh, me in terms of these videos, and that's not an ego trip on my part necessarily. What it is is I want to see evidence of you engaging the document, this document, this video, um, as you are putting together your own arguments. So you might find yourselves uh, agreeing with some of my conclusions, you might find yourself disagreeing with some of my conclusions, you might find yourself objecting to some of my observations. All of that is perfectly reasonable and what I hope you do is use those uh, opportunities as you know, uh, instances in your writing where you can cite or quote or paraphrase what's going on here and you can incorporate that into your own writing okay and that'll be a significant thing for you to do this semester so in terms of how to approach these videos my advice is to come to them with your notebook uh, open and ready to go to listen for what sound like the main ideas to record those ideas uh, in your notebook um, and then I would encourage you to timestamp them okay the big benefit you have here is that you can see uh, when and when it is in a video that I say something so if I make a comment you know 15 minutes in 16 minutes in you can note that and then you can cite that uh, in your um, reference okay it's also important that you indicate that you have attended to the entire lecture so if you know all of your references to the videos are the first two minutes of the videos uh, then that might raise some alarm bells over over time and I don't expect that of anybody but just be aware of that okay so uh, keep that in mind as we go through the term and also you know this is obviously an online class but if I say something that is confusing and I don't clarify please let me know send me an email um, you know post a message let me know you know this was not clear could you please go into more detail about something and I would be very happy to or could you clar clarify what you mean by something and I would be very happy to okay so that's just a little shorthand uh, in terms of how to watch these videos how to be engaged with these videos over the course of the semester um, so we'll move on from there all right so we are starting our first week in this course and in our first week we're going to be kind of diving into really the second half of the 18th century uh, and looking at the work primarily of a poet by the name of William Blake and William Blake may be somebody that you are more or less familiar with if you're not familiar with him at all that is not a problem at all the whole point of a survey course like this and maybe we'll just step back here for a second is to give you an opportunity to have general exposure to a number of authors okay that's a key idea here general exposure to a number of authors and the idea is that by exposing you generally to a number of authors you can get a sense of not only how these voices can be connected to one another but also what it is that resonates with you what it is that you find to be particularly intellectually or artistically uh, or emotionally just you know exciting uh, so what is it that, that that resonates with you what is it that doesn't this is a process all English majors go through and most people uh, will tend to find a lot of substance probably it's a pretty safe bet in the canonical uh, readings uh, that I give you this semester um, although it's not necessarily going to be the case that that, that always happens for you um, but we want you to walk out of this course in 15 weeks with broad exposure 
okay, so that you can then begin to build on that exposure in your subsequent classes. So you can get into more detail about William Blake or more detail about, um, you know, uh, Beckett or more detail about any number of authors we're going to look at this semester in a future course. And that's how English classes work. That's how a literature class works. Much like your writing classes where you develop the basic writing skills and then those basic writing skills are then useful to you in subsequent classes. In an English survey class you get exposed to some fundamental people, uh, places, and ideas and then you go on to use those in subsequent classes. Okay? So that's one thing to keep in mind. Maybe one more comment before we get going uh, too far into the course is that I am going to be including a novel in this course this term. It's already included in your Norton Anthology, so you're not going to have to pick that up elsewhere. It's a short novel. Uh, we're going to be reading Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness, okay? Um, but just be aware that comes up a little bit later in the course, and it's a slightly longer reading. We are also going to be incorporating a full-length play uh, into this course, and that is going to be Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, and that again comes up near the end of the term. Um, and I'll be, sold, and I'll be uh, uh, suggesting some versions to watch, to view, um, of the play. Uh, I find that watching plays, uh, if, if you don't have a strong background in, in theater or if you haven't read many plays before, it can be immensely more rewarding to, to watch a play than it is necessarily to read a play. Um, but the reading is also, of course, fundamental. So anyway, just be aware that's coming up in the, in the future uh, in terms of all the things that we do. So what I want to do today is I just want to start with a common understanding, a, a foundation for the course. And this is something I like to do in my classes. I've done it in several other classes. Those of you who had me last term remembered that we started our class on British Literature 1 with this fundamental idea from, and I don't have the book out right now, but Northrop Frye's uh, Secular Scripture. Okay, actually, I have the book. Um, let me get it out one moment. Okay, so you might remember that from, from British Literature 1, we started with Northrop Frye as the secular scripture, and we started with this fundamental idea that all cultures um, have a deep investment in stories. All right, And that idea is meant to be controversial because not everyone's going to agree with it. And it rests on a bunch of different definitions. What is a culture? What is a story? What does it mean to have a deep investment in something? But we need to have a basic idea to start with. And we are going to, and I have some other things we're going to work with here in a moment, but one of the, the fundamental idea that I want us to have at the foundation of our course, okay, at the foundation of our course, is that by about, and this also comes from Fry, okay, uh, um, this is a great text, I'd recommend it strongly to any of you who are really interested in being an English major in the long run, okay, the secular scripture, the study of, uh, the, stru the, study of the structure of romance is this fundamental idea that about four or five centuries ago, but certainly by the end of the 18th century, uh, both the Western world, okay, and also many audiences who read English, read works produced in English, um, there was an increased demand in fiction and poetry for a balance between what we might hear call very broadly um, um, realism and fantasy. Okay, realism and fantasy. And let me just define those terms in a little bit of detail because they might not mean exactly what you think that they mean. Okay, so when I say realism, um, you could be confused. Uh, and you might think that I'm talking about literature that is just focused on real stuff. And the further we get into this course, the bigger those quotation marks are going to get around the real. But don't let that blow your mind right now. When I use the word realism right now, what I simply mean, okay, is writing that conforms to ordinary experience writing that conforms to ordinary experience. So what I mean by that is I can turn to a novel, an early novel, like let's say Robinson Crusoe, which some of you may be familiar with, some of you may not be that familiar with. Regardless, I can look at a novel like Robinson Crusoe and I can see that money is important to Crusoe's life. His business ventures require resources, plantations, that he has to manage, 
and he can successfully manage them and become rich, or he can unsuccessfully manage them and become poor. And I also see in Robinson Crusoe a young man who has a strong desire to get away from uh, the town that he grew up in. He has a strong desire to leave his home. He has a strong desire to strike out and encounter the world on its own terms to gain experience and perhaps have adventure in his life. Okay, so those two basic things, um, finance, business, and the psychological makeup of a late adolescent male, certainly could be female, but in terms of Robinson Crusoe, it's a male character, uh, wanting to move out beyond what is known. These are things that would relate to ordinary experience, okay, for the vast number of readers at the time. So people who are literate in late uh, 18th century um, um, England, okay, which is the same period, by the way, in which we start to get the American Revolution really rolling. But anyway, in terms of England, readers could pick up a book like Robinson Crusoe, written quite a bit before, but they could pick up a book like Robinson Crusoe and say, okay, there's stuff in here that is real. Okay, business, psychological makeup of a person who wants to go off, also his religious affiliations, things like that, would strike readers as as real. Okay. The other half of that is fantasy. Okay. Or to use Fry's term, romance. And when we think about romance, when we think about fantasy, why don't we for a moment just think about fairy tales? Because that's what Fry is actually talking about and it can help us understand where we're going. So there's a very long, multi-millennia long tradition in written language and also in the oral tradition into ancient times of what Fry identifies as the romance or what we might think of as simply fairy tales. Okay, so these are just essentially stories that contain things that do not exist in the world of everyday experience. So unless you have some kind of special ability, you're not going to encounter witches or dragons or, um, you know, monsters in swamps or have wishes granted to you or be chased after by an evil queen who thinks that you're the you know most beautiful person in creation and so you must be destroyed. We have this long tradition of fairy tales, of, of, of fantasy, very long tradition uh, of fairy tales and fantasy. And we'll be talking a lot about that as we go through this course as well. But by the time we get to the late 18th century, for a bunch of reasons that we're not going to talk about today, but which we'll slowly begin to understand as we get further into this course, um, we have readers who have more and more interest in documents that have a balance of um, the realistic realism, ordinary experience, and fantasy. Okay, so again, I want to go back to Robinson Crusoe for a second. Again, it may not be a text that you know. You probably know the basic gist, though, of Robinson Crusoe, which is that there's an individual who's shipwrecked, who ends up on an island, lives there for an extraordinary amount of time, um, and then is rescued and goes home. And while he's on the island, he encounters pirates and cannibals and all of these things. Now, the business side of Robinson Crusoe, okay, the, the psychological... Um, some aspects of Robinson Crusoe, the many declarations of faith that are made in Robinson Crusoe all pretty much correlate with this idea of ordinary experience or lived experience for readers of the text at the time. The shipwreck, the surviving the pirate invasion, the close encounter with the cannibals, the incredibly unlikely surviving marooned miraculously on an island. These are all components of fantasy. And if you go back to fairy tales, the history of the romance, and those prose narratives, you will find these things again and again and again and again and again. Okay. So what Daniel Defoe does brilliantly in Robinson Crusoe, so brilliantly you almost don't notice it, is he takes the romance and he takes this increasing desire for realism, and he finds a way to put them together. And lo and behold, what you have is a text that continues to be read broadly many centuries after it was first written. 
And there's multiple ways to look at it. it. It itself has given rise to a whole tradition called the Robin Sage. And we'll talk about that maybe in the future. You're not reading Robinson Crusoe for me, but that's the essential situation that you're walking into. Okay, so one of the things Fry does is he makes us aware that there is this tension between realism and fantasy, and more and more authors are kind of getting into the game of writing about or writing writing you know work that finds a way to balance these competing interests. There's a couple other things going on at the same time that I also want to make you aware of, and this comes from um, Benedict. Uh, Anderson, uh, Benedict Anderson, who, who unfortunately passed away uh, over our break period. Uh, he is a titanic thinker and a great, great commentator on the subject of nationalism. Now, he also says a lot of interesting things about literature as well, but he says some really interesting things in Imagine Communities. This is probably his best known work. Uh, the first two chapters, um, in particular, of this of this document. Um, again, you know, the cultural currency of this within the English major is is pretty enormous. Um, one of the things he says in, in this text that's really interesting, and it kind of correlates with what Fry is saying, is he says that at about this same time period, um, what we have is more and more people who are thinking of themselves as existing in the same time. And I know that might sound weird to you, and I don't want to make it too strange on our first day together, but one of the things Anderson is talking about is how in pre-industrial uh, nations, okay, um, the clock that you think about, like, you know, 12 to 12 and 12.35 and whatever time you're watching it right now, um, this video, the, the clock is something that kind of organizes your day, but it's something that also lets you imagine what other people are doing, right? Because you can look at the clock and you can ask yourself, what is my mom doing at this time? What is my dad doing at this time? What is a relative doing at this time? What is a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever doing at this time? A friend at this time? That way of looking at a clock and thinking, I'm connected to all these people um, all, over the, all over the world, really, is how we think about it now, um, is really a product of the kind of modern nation. Okay, and that, that kind of coincides with the general time period Fry is talking about. And one of the things that happens, Anderson points out, is that we start to get things like newspapers. And you look at a newspaper, and I know for many of you, 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 know, you haven't had as much experience with newspapers as I had growing up because they're not as popular anymore. But you look at a newspaper, and it says, here are all the important things that happened yesterday. And so that kind of connects us as a community. Yesterday we were a community, and yesterday here were all the important things that happened. Now we have you know, websites, we have things like Facebook, which will tell you in a much more detailed way, here's all the important things your friends were doing at these exact times. So one hour ago, two hours ago, six hours ago. Here's what they were doing, and you can imagine yourself existing in the same kind of time frame with them. So while I was doing this, they were doing that. It's something that's fundamental to our culture, but that we don't think about very often. And the question you might have is, well, what did we have before this? And, and the answer for many people um, that would go on to work in English, but also just simply be affiliated with the Western world, uh, is, is, is religious tradition and religious calendars uh, in the West, in, in pre-industrial agrar agrarian societies. Um, according to Benedict Anderson. It's a fascinating argument. So one of the things that you're going to see this semester that you, you might not have been too attentive to in British Literature 1 uh, or some other earlier course is you're going to see a lot of authors struggling with this idea of community and what connects us in community. One of the very first things you're going to read uh, from William Blake, you're going to read London, a very famous short poem in which he writes in a way that everyone in London, which is this vast metropolis even then, okay, uh, he finds a way to kind of connect everybody and give this sense of, of social and cultural connection, um, which is a concern that's going to be in a lot of the early writings uh, that we look at this semester. We'll see a lot of it in Wordsworth as well. But there's this burgeoning sense for many of our authors, not just of a, of a balance between kind of uh, realism and fantasy, but there's also this fundamental question of what connects us as a society, what connects us as a, as a unit. And there's temporal implications for that, by which I mean time and chronology and all of that. But there's also these other, these other themes. Um, and so uh, Anderson's work, on early nations is is pretty important. And then the final um, individual I kind of want to throw your way um, 
is um, is Eric Auerbach, and he, this is someone that you don't really necessarily need to read right now. Okay, but he has a very well-known work called uh, Mimesis. Mimesis, um, the representation of reality in Western literature. And you might get from the subtitle that the representation of reality is really important to what Fry is talking about, about this increasing need that people seem to have to mix the fantastical with, with the mundane. And if you want a really kind of very current example of that, we could of course point to the Harry Potter series, okay, which I know many of you probably have read, um, which is that exact that. It is the drudgery and the boredom of kind of middle class you know, British existence with its school and its and jobs and all of that, and then it's mixed in with, you know, the fantasy of a fantasy school. And these two things come together, and wow, people sure seem to like reading that. There's nothing new here. This is many centuries old. But one of the things, many, many centuries old, one of the things that Auerbach talks about that is, is really significant to the work we're going to be doing um, and this isn't anything that's particularly kind of localized in the text. He talks about it throughout, which is why I'm not going to be recommending that you uh, read it for me this semester, is, is he talks about the different practices that societies have for representing both the world they live in and also the world of imagination, the symbolic world, um, the abstract world, which for many people is as significant as the physical world that they inhabit. And we'll have a lot of moments this semester where we think about that. We think about uh, aspiration, we think about dreaming, we think about different faith systems, we think about different aesthetic systems that people prescribe to, which have nothing perhaps to do with, with the real physical world that you inhabit, but which are perhaps more important to you in that world than the real physical world that you inhabit. And we're gonna see a lot of that in this course um, particularly um, in a lot of the poetry that we work through uh, in the first several weeks that we are together in this class. So I just wanted to start us with kind of the, a few fundamental ideas, and again, drawing from Fry and Anderson and generally from Auerbach. This is someone English majors tend to get closer to the end of their um, formal, formal undergraduate education, but at the graduate level it tends to be somewhat important, but you don't need to be worried about that right now. All you need to be worried about right now um, is, is, is beginning. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to start reading um, works from several centuries ago, okay? Because we need to approach them with a certain level of humility. And this might be very important to you if you are not someone who has taken English classes before um, or who has uh, just kind of started out on this path. Okay, so one of the things you learn about in your writing courses um, is about the rhetorical situation and the relationship between an author and audience and a text. Okay, an author and audience and a text. And so it's, it's really crucial um, for a couple of reasons for us to keep that in mind. Let's talk about why. You and I live in a society, and we'll see this by the end of the term, but one of the things we need to be aware of right now is that we live in a society that inundates us with entertainment. Okay, you... Every, virtually everywhere you look, you're not only encountering advertisements, but you're encountering stories, sometimes quite small stories, that have been designed specifically to get your attention to elicit some kind of emotional response from you uh, in a positive or a negative way. So whether it's the movies you're watching, the television shows you're watching, the novels you're reading, the comic books you're reading, the video games you're playing, the music that you're listening to, the music videos that you're watching, you're in, you are kind of cocooned in the contemporary world in, in fiction. It's everywhere, and a lot of it has been designed um, to get a particular response from you. The, the tragedy, perhaps, for the modern reader, okay, is that they then turn to poems, short stories, novels from distant eras, and they look at them and they say, well, this doesn't entertain me, so this is no good. Okay. That's a very poor conclusion to come to. Now, it might indeed be the case that a piece of writing is not very entertaining. And it might also be the case that it's not very good, which is always possible, even in the Norton. But you don't want to make your immediate gut reaction to the text your final determination about the text. And that is because, and again, this is the part that requires humility on, this, on the part of the reader, it wasn't written for you. 
um, the vast majority of things we look at in this class were not written for you. Now, there are fundamental things about you that the authors probably, as fellow human beings, can you know, land right on and hit with and resonate with and get your attention by drawing attention to. And that's all really important. And that's fundamental to your progression through a course like this. And it's part of how you get excited about what you read. But if you read something like Songs of Innocence and Experience, which you're going on to read right now in this course, as you'll see from um, our uh, syllabus, and you say, well, I'm excited or I'm not excited, that's not the right thing to conclude, at least to end. What you want to be asking yourself is, you know, what is interesting about this? Now, the immediate context you have for that is the lecture I just spent the first 24 minutes talking about, okay? But you might also find that perhaps that lecture is in no way helpful to helping you decipher what's going on in the poem, and that's okay. Then we ask ourselves, what might be significant about this? How might this relate to other things I have encountered in my life? We also need to be aware at a very practical level that there's also going to be, particularly early in this course, some linguistic challenges. Because again, we have poetry a, written in a vernacular that is not yours uh, for many good reasons. And so there is an effort we have to make reading several centuries in the future to kind of swim back towards what the author is saying and how he or she is saying that. And your Norton will annotate quite heavily but if there are words along the way, you need to understand that it's very normal to stop and look up words. It's very normal to annotate your reading. It's very normal simply to be confused, sometimes for significant passages, um, as long as you are continuing to push through and realizing, well, that was confusing, but I'll keep, I'll keep on, I'll keep going. That's the fundamental movement of an English major through a document, is I can be confused here, um, and that's okay. Um, because right now I'm trying to experience the text, and I also realize that it will take, more likely than not, multiple readings of a text before I gain real confidence with it. Which is maybe the last thing I'll say um, this term before I kind of pivot out of the, out of the video, is that when we uh, read closely, deeply, with a plan, in an effort to see how different works relate to each other, it always takes multiple readings, and it's never the case that you get something completely the first time through. Your first reading will largely be a superficial reading as you simply become familiar with the basic ideas. But then we begin to dig into the text, we start to think about what is being said and how it is being said, and at that point we gain the ability to talk about the document critically, or at least a little bit. And that's really the goal. So do not be at all um, discouraged if you pick up a poem or a novel or a play this semester, and you're like, oh, I don't quite know what this author is saying, and I really don't quite know what to say about it. Okay, so that's what I'm offering here as kind of an initial lecture to get you started with your reading. I haven't said an awful lot about the William Blake readings here, so I think what I'm going to do a little bit later this week is upload a video about William Blake and about the readings that we've done for William Blake. But this video should be enough for you to then, after you do the reading or as you're doing the reading, begin to put together your vlog and a, and a discussion post for the week, which is what I'll have required for this first short week um, by Friday. Okay? If there are questions or concerns along the way, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm really looking forward to working with you all this semester, and uh, let's, let's get into it.